our agenda today promises to be an interesting one as we are presenting candidates vying for their party's nomination for three different legislative bodies. Unopposed candidates will not be debating, but all candidates have been offered the opportunity to display their campaign literature on tables in the lobby. In keeping with league policy, the moderator, and today we have two, cannot vote in any election they are moderating. Therefore, we are appreciative that Valerie Krejci and Cindy Canary have agreed to be here. They will explain the format in more detail, but basically you will write your questions on index cards that league members will make available to you. Our sorters will put them in categories and the cards will be brought to the podium. In addition, readers of Patch, the online newspaper, have asked if they could send questions into us via me email and we agreed with the understanding that their questions would be treated in the same way as if they were here. That is, sent to our sorters who would add them to the categories. I believe Jacob Nelson from Patches will be receiving the questions and giving them to our ushers. I want to bring to your attention that our voters guide is available online on our website, which is www lwvhp.org and when you get when it opens you just click on guide and you will find the our candidates guide every candidate responded to questions we sent them and their answers were entered as they wrote them also we hope to have dvds of the debate available at the highland park library within a few days and now for the debate so i'm going to turn it over to valerie krejci who will be our first moderator for the first and second debate <laughs> Thank you. Um, you don't want to talk too much to make it all right. Yeah, you want to be able to hear me, but you don't want any feedback. All right. Okay. I'm just checking, testing, testing. Uh, I do not live in this area. I do not vote in this area. That's the number one requirement to be the moderator, and I passed. So, and I have done this before, and I've done it before for Highland Park, which is why my number always comes up. Oh, there, see, I must have to stand right here. All right, now, I have to go over the ground rules. We have two timers up front here. Raise your hands, ladies. Okay, they're the ones that will put up the flag that our candidates have a minute and a half for opening remarks, a minute for responses, and a minute for their closing statements. We need to have the candidates come up here, too. <laughs> We should introduce them. Yes, we have. We're going to do the um, 29th uh, district Senate uh, race first, the state Senate. These are the Democratic primary candidates, Julie Morrison and Milton Sumption. Okay, before the, um, we met in the lobby, uh, we flipped the coin and uh, um, Julie won. She gets to go first, but that means that uh, uh, Mr. Sumption will go uh, first for the closing. Okay, yes, we gotta test all this out, make sure it's gonna work. Um, the people in the audience, the league members who are taking your questions are walking around and they have uh, index cards. Uh, if you put up your hand, they'll give you the pencil and you can write your question down and it will go to the back. Uh, we have a um, panel of people who screen these questions. Now this is because we don't want you swearing um, we don't want reped repetitive questions. We don't want offensive questions. Uh, we're running this and that's what we've decided and that's what works best. When we've left it to an open mic in the past, we've had misbehavior and we're not gonna have that today. So um, I want to just say that's very typical uh, league ground rules and that's how we're playing today. Uh, your timers, your questioners, they bring me the questions, I read the questions, they have one minute to respond. We have an hour, we can get to a lot, a lot of different things. So I'd like to start us off by letting uh, Julie Morrison have her opening minute and a half statement. Thank you. I am so happy to be here today. I wanna to thank the league for organizing this event this afternoon and for giving us candidates an opportunity to speak to you about the things that we all care most about. My name is Julie Morrison and I'm a Democratic candidate for the 29th District State Senate. 
Early voting starts tomorrow. You're going to hear that a lot from the league ladies today. But before the very first ballot has been cast, we all know what the mandate is. Go to Springfield and fix it. Get us back on track and stand up for us. I've been a leader in our district for many years and I've been elected four times as township supervisor. For the past 15 years, I've been trusted by the voters to manage a township, to balance its budget each and every year, to work with the neediest residents of the township, and to find solutions to problems both for individuals and for the community. I'll take those same skills, this experience, and my 100% commitment to Springfield. When Susan Garrett asked me to run, I thought long and hard about this. It's a tremendous commitment, especially at the time when our state is in such economic distress. And I know it's a big responsibility. But I'm here this afternoon, ready for the challenges, and with a promise to you that I will hit the ground running, I'll be a full-time legislator, and I'll be a leader from day one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and now our other candidate is Milton Sumption. You have a minute and a half. Good afternoon, my name is Milton Sumption and I'm a Democratic candidate for the state legislature in the 29th Legislative District. I wanna thank the League of Women Voters and all of you for participating this afternoon. We're at a crossroads here in Illinois. Our problems are well known, a lagging local economy, state budget deficits year after year, and a state pension system that is unfunded by tens of billions of dollars, and a lack of leadership to fix these problems. We know how we got to this place. For years, we have had career politicians in Illinois who put their own self-interest first and not the public's interest first. The political establishment has failed us. They have literally pushed us to the brink of insolvency. This election is an opportunity to choose new leadership and a new direction for Illinois. Voters across the district tell me that they are sick and tired of career politicians who are incapable of solving today's problems in our state. They tell me they want representatives with real world experience, not government experience. They want people in office who have integrity and fresh ideas. People who will do what's right for the state and for the people. I'm running for the state Senate because I believe we can do better here in Illinois. I am the only lifelong Democrat in the race with public and private sector experience. I was a math teacher in the Peace Corps, legislative assistant for US Senator Tom Daschle, and 15 years of experience in the private sector and finance. I believe I can make a difference in this race and improve Illinois. Thank you, thank you. So now we've had both opening statements. We're going to move on to our first question. First question will go to Mr. Sumption. Uh, here it is. What is your first bill you would like to create? Well, I think um, as we, we certainly know in, uh, in this state, um, our local economy lags um, its potential and the national economy. So in terms of introducing legislation, um, one of the first considerations I would give to um, um, policy um, um, introductions would be um, policies that would help get our economy going. I have a few ideas around public-private partnerships um, that would help generate new revenue for our state. Um, I would introduce um, investment tax credits that would uh, inspire greater um, investment in, in uh, industries of the future, technology, clean energy, um, healthcare, and um, those are the initial legislative um, proposals that I would put forward. We need to grow our economy and create jobs in this state. That's a number one priority. Thank you. And now, um, Ms. Morrison. I hope some of you read the Chicago Tribune today because they had my first piece of legislation covered pretty well. In Pekin, there's a manufacturing company that is partnering with a local community college to ascertain what the trends are and the needs are for skilled labor and job openings, and then working with the colleges to make sure that there's relevant training available. This would be something I think we should take statewide right away. Let's get to work and get people back to the jobs. Um, I did this on a small scale um, at the township office. We had CLC, the Jewish Vocational Services, doing some job coaching and a staffing agency. And working together, they were able to identify for 40 people that walked through 
jobs that were available and the ways they could get skills fairly quickly and fairly inexpensively. This is a great idea and we should take advantage of the community colleges that are already in place. Thank you. Now we're off and going. Question number two will go first to Ms. Morrison. Uh, Illinois has lowest credit rating of all the states. It cannot pay its bills and it has just raised personal income taxes. What specific plans do you have to get the state on track? Please don't insult us with generalities such as I will eliminate waste or I will be physically, respo physically responsible. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just reading them. <laughs> okay. Well, I think, the, I think the response I just gave is a really good first start. My belief is that if people have jobs, everything else is gonna trickle down. I would do whatever is necessary to get people who want jobs back into the workplace. At the same time, we need to make sure that we are not gonna pull out the safety net from under people who are desperately needing um, services they've been promised. Uh, we need to make sure there's capital available for small businesses as they try to expand and hand in hand with that is to make sure that we are providing the labor force that they need. So providing the education and the connections for those people at the same time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sumption. Well, clearly, um, if we have a growing local economy um, and more people are going back to work, we're gonna have an expanding tax base. And that will help us address many of the budget issues that we face in the state. It'll help us address the, the, the huge pension deficit that we have in the state. And when the, I've worked in the financial services sector for over 15 years, I understand how credit rating agencies look at debt, evaluate debt, and, and rate debt. And one of the reasons we have a low credit rating in this state is because we have been fiscally irresponsible um, decade after decade. We spent more than we brought in, and we have not um, funded pensions for decades. And credit rating agencies look at that, and that's why we have the lowest bond rating in the country. If we are more responsible at the state level, we, we, with our budget and with how we fund pensions, our, our rating will improve. But the key is to grow our economy. We have an extending ta expanding tax base. We're gonna generate the revenue um, to balance our budget and fund pensions and um, improve our credit rating engines. Okay, thank you. Um, now we're going back to you for uh, this question. Are you in favor of school vouchers and why? Or why not, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> right, why not? Um, I, um, I think I, I'm, I'm open to creative ideas that are, that are going to improve um, uh, education for um, students all across the state. Um, I am not in favor in, of school vouchers um, because I, I, I'm concerned that the people, the people who will use them are not necessarily the people who would need them. Um, lower income families who really would like to move their children to better schools um, aren't, with the vouchers are still not gonna be able to afford to send their kids to better schools. I think it drains resources from public school districts. Um, and so I, I would not favor generally the, the school vouchers um, as, as a way to um, improve um, education and send kids to different schools. But I would, free, I would support creative solutions that, that protect funding for existing schools, but also provide opportunities for students and underperforming schools to go to better schools. Uh, Julie Morrison. I'm categorically against vouchers for the simple reason that that's, it's tax dollars, it's public tax dollars that are funding our public schools. We do not need to take away any of those resources. Our schools are already strapped and doing the best they can, and that would diminish the ability for them to do that and to serve the public they're supposed to. If you wanna to go to a private school, that's great. That's your option, that's your choice if you can afford to do so, but not on the, not on the public dollar. Okay, good. Uh, next question goes back to you. Um, uh, do you believe in giving companies tax incentives to stay in Ch the Chicago area? I think that should be Illinois, but go ahead. Well, I think, you know, we've recently seen what happened when Sears and CME, which are, you know, the most current examples of giving them a tax break, a tax incentive, 
Um, I, I bet the legislature was between a rock and a hard place on this. There would have been a tremendous outcry if we had lost the jobs that Sears has here. That being said, there's two things. I think we need to make these kind of incentives available if we're going to continue them to small and middle-sized businesses. It should be across the board. It should be very transparent as to who's getting them and how you get them. And secondly, um, gosh, I lost my second thought there when she flashed that little sign in front of me. 30 seconds. Um, no, I mean, I think we need to really consider this on a case-by-case -case base. And hopefully we won't have to do, continue to do this to keep business here. Illinois is a great place to do business. We have a lot of advantages and a lot of reasons people should stay. Milton Sumption. Um, a few points I'd make here. One is um, Illinois is a great place to do business. We are geographically desirable. Uh, we have a talented workforce that uh, has a great work ethic. Um, and we have world-class educational institutions to prepare workers for jobs of the 21st century. I think clever CEOs and CFOs have done a very good job of putting policy, politicians and policymakers on the defensive about why this is a bad place to do business. They're just not right. We need to go on the offensive about why this is a great place to do business. In terms of tax incentives, um, I would use a more disciplined approach um, to uh, identifying which tax incentives make sense for us and which don't. In the private sector, when companies invest dollars, they understand what return they're going to get on, the, on those invested dollars. Tax incentives are like those investment dollars. We need to do cost-benefit analysis to figure out what kind of return we're going to get for those incentives in terms of economic development and job creation. That's a disciplined approach I would take to any tax incentive um, proposed. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, where do you stand on the uh, concealed carry bill or law? I'm, I'm, I'm against concealed carry. I, I, don't, I don't think it makes any sense whatsoever um, for people to be carrying concealed weapons in a um, uh, civilized society like ours. Um, there's just no reason whatsoever that um, the people should, should be carrying concealed weapons. I grew up in a rural area. Um, where hunting was popular. Um, I've been around firearms, um, and um, it just doesn't make any sense. Firearms are fine for sport, but they're not fine to be walking down the street with. So I'd be against concealed carry. Uh, Julie Morrison. I'm going to save us some time and tell you that I agree with everything Milton just said. 100 <laughs> percent. He's right on this one. Thank and you, you know, it's okay to agree on yeah, things. That's, that's, right. Right. that's nice. That's it's, right. it's nice to agree. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. All right. Now, uh, I got a new one for you. Uh, where do you stand in the conflicts between religious beliefs and women's rights? Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, that goes first to you, um, Ms. Morrison. And I'm assuming this is uh, aimed at women's rights to, to choose and to manage their own reproductive health care. I'm a 100% in favor of choice. Those rights that were really hard fought for are being challenged in states like Virginia, where there is this terrible bill that's gone through both houses and it's on the governor's desk that would require transvaginal ultrasounds before um, a procedure, a di abortion procedure can take place. In Illinois, there's even some things going through the house that would bring the state of Illinois um, into the doctor's offices with the patient. Absolutely no way. I'm completely against um, those types of tenants. I'm going to safeguard a woman's right to choose and to answer the question. It has nothing to do with religion. And I am a Roman Catholic. Thank you. Uh, fine. Uh, now, uh, Mr. Milton Sutton. I'm 100% pro choice. I always have been. Um, I think that um, a woman's reproductive um, health. Um, decisions should be made between her and her doctor. Um, I, uh, those rights have been hard fought for for decades. They need to be protected. Um, they seem to be constantly under attack year after year. Um, if I'm fortunate enough to be elected, I'll fight to continue to protect those rights. I'll also fight to um, um, find funding and promote um, greater uh, women's health care 
um, initiatives, more mammograms, um, pap smear tests, um, things that, that are early detective tests to um, help uh, detect potentially life-threatening um, illnesses early so that they can be treated, cured, and women can go on to you know, live normal, healthy lives. But I'm 100% pro-choice. Okay, thank you. Now we're on to question number seven. And this goes back to you, um, Mr. Sumption. Other than putting them in jail or punish, pushing them into the gutter, what do you propose for rehabilitating homeless veterans into useful and productive citizens? I, uh, I think we ought to do everything we can to, to help um, facilitate um, productive lives for our veterans. Um, those people have put their lives on the line for us. And we owe them, um, we owe them a debt of gratitude, and we owe them our best efforts to make their lives productive, healthy, happy back here um, on our own soil. Uh, many of them left our country and um, stood in harm's way for, for our own well-being. Um, my sister uh, was in the military, my brother-in-law was in the military, they were both in the Air Force. Um, so I have some sense for what military personnel um, do, the sacrifices they make. Uh, so in terms of uh, uh, proposing um, what, how we would take care of, I think we need perhaps halfway houses to help them transition back. We need to provide educational um, opportunities for them. And we need to engage the private sector to re-employ them when they are back here. Uh, Julie Morrison. Well, I can, I can tell you the experience that I've had in my job as the township supervisor. I'm continuing to work with a man who is a veteran um, He's been coming to my office for the last 10 or 12 years. He was a veteran, he's about 47 now. Um, he's been homeless at least 10 or 15 years and he sort of just exists within uh, the neighborhoods of Highland Park and Deerfield. And if you guys live in these communities, you may have seen him. Um, people in our communities are very charitable and kind to him. What I've tried to do is uh, put him with the resources that he needs. A lot of times it's mental illness that keeps people homeless. And they're unable or unwilling to accept the help that's out there, that's already in programs. I finally am really happy to tell you that um, we did get him on disability. He is receiving a small grant. He is starting to see a psychiatric nurse that we arranged for him to see through pads. And we are uh, temporarily housing him someplace that's not in the train station finally. I'm very proud of that and we have to take each case one at a time, but these guys all need help. Okay, uh, now it comes back to you for the um, eighth question we're on. Illinois mm -hmm. has been by far the most government entities of any state in the country. Are you in favor of consolidation or elimination of townships or other entities? Great question, especially for me, because there's probably <laughs> nobody in this room that knows more about township government than me. I can tell you about my township, which is lean and mean, and you get a lot of bang for your buck. I do the casework myself, and I deal with people when they come in and need help, regardless of whether it's a lost job or prescriptions they can't afford. But I can tell you that there has to be, for townships to continue, they have to do what we've done, and that is to evolve into modern day levels of government. You have to fill the gaps and not duplicate services. And there is a lot of that going on, unfortunately. Yes, I'm in favor of consolidating governments where um, services are duplicated. Tax dollars should be spent one time and one time only. And I would say that every local government, regardless if it's a library, a drainage district, a mosquito abatement district, they should all be on the table. We all need, we need to look at every single one of them. And if you can't justify your existence, you shouldn't be on the tax roll. Milton Sumption, your turn. Township, townships are, for, are a 19th century form of government. They've outlived their usefulness. Um, uh, we are in the 21st century. The services, generally the vast majority of the services that are provided by townships 
um, could be pr provided more efficiently um, at other levels of government. So I would favor um, abolishing townships. Good government organizations um, have taken this position um, because it's just another layer of government that taxpayers shouldn't have to pay for. Um, there's no reason in the 21st century that we, we need a uh, form of government that was originated back in the late in the 1800s. Um, they've outlived their usefulness by decades, and uh, good government organizations, as I, I've said, um, would support abolishing them, and I, I think we should do away with them as well. Um, it's another way to achieve efficiencies um, and save taxpayer dollars. Can I have a 10 second <laughs> response on that? Oh, oh wow! <laughs> if, if, I, if I get if I get a, oh, if I get a response, sure, go ahead. I, I just I just want to point out that when a move is made to dissolve any local form of government, we need to be very thoughtful of the fact that these services will either disappear or be passed on to another municipality, and they will want probably some tax dollars to perform those same services. It's not going to be free, and in fact, it may actually be a little bit more distant like Waukegan, for example. Thank you. Um, you have, can rebut to that if you want, to make it okay. fair, because we're, we're, we're going a little off the right. rules here. Right, sure. No, that's fine. Um, well, sure, of course. I, I didn't say abolishing the services. I said um, providing the services more efficiently with another form of government, and a lot of times that would be county government. Um, so, you know, perhaps there, I mean, depending on it, eight, particular township, there may be some services that are really not needed, but um, in, in most cases, many of those services are needed. So yeah, they would have to be transferred, but it's just another layer of government. In the private sector, we eliminate layers of unneeded management all the time. And this is one way for us to do it in the public sector, save taxpayer money, um, redirect those resources to education or other needs. That's good. I like that. That was a, a, a two-part answer, and you stayed uh, civil and, and within reasonable time limits. So this is okay. We're civil people. You know, it's very hard sometimes to. I mean, one-minute response. You don't sure. want to keep on going, right. but in this case, you needed it. So we're we're okay with that. Thanks. No. Now here no, comes. Um, oh, that's the same one. Uh, I'm going back to you. And uh, should there be cuts in service? or cuts in payments to doctors for Medicaid? I think as many of you know, Medicaid is uh, one of the biggest budget items in the state budget. It's one of the um, budget items that's um, um, driving our, our state to the, the brink of insolvency. Um, I think that um, uh, certain services, we may have to consider reining in some, uh, uh, some of the fees that we pay to doctors. Um, but um, doctors need to be paid um, competitively because if they're not, they're going to cease performing those services. And um, Medicaid patients are, need services that, that those doctors perform. So we need to figure out how, how to manage the cost of Medicaid. Um, provide, uh, I view all issues through a lens of fairness and responsibility. So we need to be fair to the doctors, but we also need to provide those services. And I would say we need to focus, one way we can save is to look at eligibility and also focus on wellness programs to keep people well and avoid um, catastrophic illnesses that cost us a lot of money. Thank you. Um, Ms. Morrison. Medicaid is about 25% of the state's budget. So we need to put everything on the table and look carefully at where we can cut and where we can't. We certainly don't want to make it impossible for physicians to, um, to accept Medicaid. That doesn't serve anybody very well. That being said, um, eligibility is a big question. 20% of Illinois residents are on Medicaid. Let's make sure that every single person, first of all, lives in Illinois, is eligible for it and, um, and it's receiving the services we can afford to provide. I think right now or recently we were providing for um, weight loss surgery. State of Illinois cannot pay for that. We don't have the money to pay for that. We should be paying only for services that are critical. And if we don't get our household in order, we're not going to be able to provide health care to the people who need it when they're sick because everybody should have access to health care when they're ill. Okay, thank you. Now, next question to Ms. Morrison. What are the skills you feel you need to develop to be an effective state senator? Uh, 
I think a state senator's got to be able to listen, and that means be available and eager to talk to people, to hear what they believe and what they say. This district is really engaged and really bright. Walking door to door and talking to people, people know what's going on, and they will share with you their ideas and their insights. That's the very first thing a legislator has got to be able to do. I think the second thing is to collaborate. When I look at big problems, whether they're in my home or at the township, I bring the resources together and the experts that know how to find the answers. You don't do it by yourself. You bridge resources, you build partnerships, that's how you get things done. Those two things, I think, are probably the main elements of being a very good state senator. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Sumption. I decided to um, get into this race because I think I have many of the skills needed to be a successful uh, state center. I think I have a background um, and, and a knowledge base that is, is um, uh, in need in this state. I spent 15 years working in the private sector in business and finance. I understand the capital markets. I understand um, a business environment. I've negotiated a number of different transactions. Um, in terms of learning uh, skills um, uh, for being effective in uh, Springfield, um, having not spent uh, my career in government, I think I'd have to learn uh, a little bit about how um, Springfield operates. And um, from what I've read in the papers and, and talking to people, it's dysfunctional. And I think I would bring a level of discipline, um, and I think I could actually perhaps teach uh, some of the folks in Springfield, um, a few valuable lessons about what, how we operate in the private sector, be more efficient, and get results for people in this state. Now, honestly, I just get these questions in the order they're given to me, but this next one <coughs> is, follows right on the heels here of your uh, newcomer here. How would you deal with Democratic leadership in Springfield if they continue to let Michael Madigan set the agenda? <laughs> I, I wasn't told what the next question was. Honestly. I know, I know. I mean, honestly, I wasn't. Um, look, I, I think, um, as I said in my opening statement, the political establishment in this state has failed us. They have far too often put their own personal interests, their own self-interests, ahead of the public's interests. And I offer voters, I offer the people of this district the opportunity for somebody who is independent-minded, somebody who is reform-minded, somebody who is driven by his own moral compass um, to go and set an example and do what is right for the people of this district. Um, I stand on principle. As I said earlier, I view issues through a lens of fairness and responsibility, and I will view every issue in that way. I will work with the leadership when needed. But when I think that they are doing something that is immoral, like not funding the pensions, immoral, like not balancing the budget year to year, I'll oppose them at every turn. That's what we need. We need somebody who is independent-minded, who has the backbone to stand up to the leadership and move this state forward and do what is right. Thank you. Um, Julie Morrison. The 29th District has a legacy of being an independent seat. The senator who is retiring now has been someone who has worked both sides of the aisle, stood up against her party when it was right for this district, and stands with it when it's the right thing to do too. I will do no less than that. I think that's absolutely what this district demands and expects and deserves. And I will do my utmost to follow in those footsteps in this instance. Okay, thank you. Um, the legislature has made a couple of attempts to limit income of non-home rule communities. Is this a good thing or not? We need to seriously consider what kind of dramatic changes this would bring to local governments. There is no one here who doesn't want to see their tax bill lowered their property tax bill. It doesn't seem fair that when our property values drop, that our property tax bills keep going up. So I would probably be in favor of this legislation. However, everybody needs to have their eyes wide open that schools in particular 
rely so much on property tax. We love our schools, we want to support our schools. This would really tie their hands. I think if this was legislation that was going to go through, we'd have to have some kind of bypass mechanism for school districts. Um, but it, it's a very good idea. In fact, two years ago in response to lower values of homes and, and residences, the township froze its levy. This last year, we saw another drop in values and we decreased our levy 5%. I know what this means and I know how to do it. Thank you. Um, Milton Sumption. Um, I think that um, uh, the state is, is looking for um, other sources of revenue and they're looking to local governments for other sources of revenue to help with um, uh, state budget issues. Um, I think we need to be very cautious about going after local governments and, and, and managing um, uh, how they collect their revenue and how much they collect. Um, school districts are, uh, as we all know, funded largely by property taxes and, uh, and people are across the, across the, the state and, and certainly in this district, um, their property values have, have declined dramatically, uh, but their tax bills have not. And uh, we need to be conscious of, of where property values are where pro uh, and, and, and where property taxes are and how, um, how those resources are, are, are allocated. I'd, I'd look at this particular legislation and as I said earlier, I view things through a uh, lens of fairness and responsibility. Um, if I thought it was fair to the local communities, uh, I, I'd consider it. Well, you know, this is the, the follow-up to this, really, the next question, uh, and it goes six, continues with you. Uh, depreciating value and rising property taxes have created serious problems for seniors on fixed incomes. What can be done to address this problem? Well, I think that um, uh, we need to reevaluate uh, when property values have, have declined dramatically, we need to reevaluate the tax bills that, that, that people um, um, uh, are, are given for their property values. Um, I know where we live, there's a lag in terms of when um, assessments um, begin to true up with um, true property values. And I think we should consider um, uh, helping expedite the process of truing up what property taxes people pay with the true value, the true market value of, of their, their properties so that they're not overpaying. Um, in terms of seniors, um, maybe we need to look at um, ways to um, help them deal with this issue, a um, uh, program that would you know, um, perhaps give them some relief um, for, for a short period of time. Um, but we need to true up property taxes with, with the market value of their homes um, more quickly. Thank you. Um, Julie Morrison. Illinois state law already has a couple things in place for seniors, senior homestead exemption mm -hmm. and the senior freeze. We get a lot of um, people that come into our office trying to get information about both of those. And the trend that I'm seeing, and probably a lot of you are, is people used to have their home as their investment, and when they got to a point where they needed to downsize or their income had dropped sufficiently and they needed to sell, they did that. They're not able to do that right now. Houses just are not moving the way they should, and so that's really, um, that's caused some real difficulties for people. One thing might be to do is to change the, the means test for senior freeze, maybe make it higher than what it is now. Um, I think that would be more than appropriate and maybe that's something we could just do on a temporary basis until the market comes back. Thank you. All right, this question goes to Julie Morrison. What is your opinion on tort reform in Illinois? Is it possible? Is it possible? <laughs> tort reform in Illinois, um, this is a question that has been kicked around so many times over the last 10 years. It seems like it's always doctors versus lawyers. And I don't think that's really what it should be about. It should be about the people who are affected by the lawsuits and the care and their ability to have the compensation they deserve, but um, not to ever make it a, a we and them thing. Tort reform is a very guarded thing. Um, 
I'm not real sure where to go with this question. Um, I, we have to make sure that people who are injured or who seek damages are fairly compensated. And I don't know that just putting in um, a cap on it, some kind of some kind of made-up cap is the way to do that. It, it's fine. Um, it's a debate here. You can't yeah. have every yeah, answer to sure. every, yeah. everything figured out. Uh, and now, uh, Mr. Sumption, you have uh, a chance at this one. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, oh, look, tort reform has talked about year after year. Um, I recall a couple of years ago when I was collecting some signatures, um, a doctor um, uh, bent my ear for, for a half an hour about tort reform. Um, I, is tort reform possible? Absolutely, I think it's possible. Um, uh, if, if we get good minds with good ideas in a room and negotiate um, what is fair to both doctors as well as patients. Um, I think that there may, we, we need to look at some limits on, 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 on perhaps certain cases um, uh, where, uh, you know, unlimited amounts that would be sought um, could, would be limited. But at the same time, if, if, if people do things wrong, if, if they malpractice, if, if they um, are negligent, um, people who suffer those damages need to be fairly compensated. And maybe we have some kind of judge, some kind of panel that reviews um, um, tort reform um, cases. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm watching the time, and I'm trying to decide what to do with these last few questions, and so I'm making some executive decisions over here. And I'm going to uh, um, drop these two that I'm, I, I am deciding are not worth it, and I'm going to go to this last question that's going to go... Let's see, first to um, Mr. Sumption, but you, and then she gets the reply, and then I think we'll go to the uh, closing statements. Mm -hmm. So this is a combo of these two questions. Uh, the state is being pushed towards pension plan reforms. Where would you draw the lines? But I want you to also include, both candidates have stated um, the economic growth resolved uh, due to the state's budget fiasco, uh, including the unfunded state pension situation. The statements are contrary to anything I've heard or read and clearly uh, predate and reason of the past five years. Can you detail the basis for glossing over the unfunded pension problem? See, I don't know what to do. I, you got to talk about pensions. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. We can do that. And, um, uh, do and then uh, you both are going to get a minute. Or if you want to rebuttal, fine. But then you're doing your closing statements, cool. and I hope we wind up at two. Okay? Can, can I propose one thing? That's kind of like a two-part question. Yes. Could we get a minute and a half each? You're fine. I mean, is that all right? That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Because there's a lot to talk about there. Yeah, I know. And I, I don't, I'm don't. i just trying to make sure we get to it. Sure. Okay. Right, right. No, exactly. So a minute and a half? Is yes. Okay. okay, great. Okay. <laughs> Um, with regard to the pension problem, um, I've, I've said this over and over again in, in neighborhoods at other forums. Um, I think it's egregious. I think it's sinful. I think it's immoral that the state legislature did not fund um, uh, state worker pensions and teachers' pensions year after year after year. Uh, that is just immoral, and that's something I would fight to put an end to. When I come from a world where you make a commitment, you keep your commitments, and the state legislature did not keep its commitments. The, the unfunded deficit is estimated around $86 billion. One of the things I have proposed is public-private partnerships to identify new revenue sources that wouldn't cost taxpayers any money. We wouldn't have to borrow any money, like, for example, financing high-voltage transmission lines across our property that would generate royalty revenue from transmitting um, wind energy from the center of this country, the Saudi Arabia wind, to parts east of us. We could generate tens of millions of dollars, perhaps more, through royalty revenue. There are other creative ideas that we can come up with to help fund pensions that weren't funded for decades. Um, going forward, we need to think creatively about how we can find a fair, sustainable solution um, to um, future um, pension needs. We need, we, need, we need a fair pension that will attract good people to state employment and teaching, but we also need to be fair to taxpayers, and we can do that. We need people who have a business background, who understand finance, and who can come up with creative solutions like the one I just mentioned um, to solve this problem, but it is doable. Thank you. And now Julie Morrison. 
pensions. We're going to spend $4.2 billion this year in the state of Illinois on pension costs. Reform is way overdue. We all agree with that. Milt and I agree on that. And when we talk about reforming pensions, everybody goes back to Senate Bill 512. And I bet a lot of you know the components that are in it and the, the three different uh, elements that are being proposed. That bill hasn't passed yet. And I think it's I think it's obvious why. Because a lot of the stakeholders who are impacted by that either haven't been at the table or find some of those elements absolutely unacceptable. We've got to have consensus. We've got to have agreement with the stakeholders, the people who are deserving and are eligible for pensions. That being said, I think if the state of Illinois, who does not have a good reputation for either paying its bills or keeping its promises, could come up with an ironclad guarantee that they would guarantee to the employees and the employers who are going to have to compromise at some point, maybe they're going to have to pay a little bit more, maybe they're going to have to retire a little bit later, written in blood, written in stone, that the state of Illinois is not going to come back and nickel and dime people over the next five and ten years. Because this problem is not going away. We're going to have this debt for a long time to come, and I think we'll reach consensus when the state guarantees that this is the fix and they won't nickel and dime us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, now we're going to wrap it up with a one-minute uh, closing statement from each candidate. Uh, that was in the original rules. I may okay. have forgotten that. Okay. Um, and we go, uh, because we started with you, we're going to start with him. Uh, uh, excuse me, not just him. Milton Sumption, your closing, closing statement. I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters. I'd like to thank Julie, and I'd like to thank all of you for participating this afternoon. In closing, I'm not a career politician. I've spent 15 years working in the world of business and finance, have the right background and the right experience to make a positive difference here in Illinois. As a state center, I'll work to grow our local economy and create jobs and solve our state's overwhelming fiscal problems. Illinois is at a crossroads, and now is the time to choose a new direction for our state. Now is the time for someone who will bring fresh ideas to solve the big problems we have here in Illinois, someone who has the leadership ability to get results, and someone who will put the public's interest first and the, and the people of Illinois' uh, 29th district interest first. My candidacy offers you that choice. I believe we can do better in Illinois. I'm ready to go to work for you. I'm ready to put Illinois back on the right track. I humbly ask for your vote in this primary election, and I thank you very much for being here this afternoon. Thank you, and now Julie Morrison. Thanks to the league again, and thanks to all of you who came out on an absolutely beautiful February Sunday afternoon to find out more about me, what I stand for, and why I'm gonna be a very good state senator for you. You're trusting your next state senator to make some very important decisions for you in Springfield. Things that are going to impact very directly your job and your family, your health care, and your schools. I have the experience and the commitment to go to work for you right now. I'm running because I know firsthand what a very good state legislator can do for the communities that she represents and the people that live in them. I've earned the, adorns, the endorsements of Planned Parenthood, Personal PAC, Illinois Education Association, Illinois Federation of Teachers, and the Democratic Township, Township Organizations of New Trier, Northfield, Wheeling, Vernon, West Deerfield, and Palatine, as well as State Senators Garrett and Schoenberg and Representatives Karen May and Elaine Neckritz. But the most important endorsement is yours, and I would be very proud and grateful for your vote. Thank you. Okay, thank you to our candidates. Uh, I want to remind you, you can early vote, and the primary is the 20th of March, and you have a choice. You should exercise. One of our candidates uh, for the next debate has, is not here, and we have called her, and uh, 
Her, uh, we have not been able to contact her. It's Lauren Torelli. When I say her, you can tell from the two names which one I'm talking about. So what we're going to do, since the league does not have what we call empty chair debates, uh, we will certainly uh, allow Dr. Nierhoff to have his say and to present himself to you as a candidate. We won't be asking him questions, but we're going to be giving him more time than just the minute and a half that he would have had as an opening statement. Uh, certainly five minutes or more, which he seems to find more than enough time. If you want more, just let us know. Uh, and what we will do, because we're not going to start the 10th Congressional District debate ahead of time, because we do, many of us know of people who are only coming for that debate and won't be arriving for a while. So just so you'll all know that um, Dr. Nierhoff will be making his statement. You can certainly visit with the candidates that are here, ask them questions on your own. I understand there is a bar inside that's open. <laughs> that <laughs> So just bear with us, and I hope you'll all understand this is a, a situation that we have absolutely no control over, and we're trying to handle it as well as we can. Uh, I look forward to talking to all of you personally, too, after Dr. Nierhoff has spoken. So I will be happy to introduce him. He is coming up to the podium as we speak, and uh, look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Uh, first of all, thank you very much for being here today. I want to especially thank the League of Women Voters for organizing this. I think they are providing a very important uh, public service. Uh, my name is Mark Nierhoff. I'm an attending physician at North Shore University Health Systems uh, I practice high-risk obstetrics. I am also a clinical associate professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine. And I'm also an executive board member of a nationwide organization uh, of physicians, of 4,000 physicians, called Docs for Patient Care. And that is an organization that is committed to pursuing responsible health care reform. I have lived in this area for 21 years. My wife Betty and I, who is in, uh, Betty is in the audience today, Betty and I lived in Deerfield for 15 years, and we moved to Lake Forest six years ago. Been in this district for 21 years. Uh, if you should elect me to go to Springfield, I will have three top priorities. Number one is Medicaid reform. Medicaid is a mess. It's the worst insurance or program in the country. It's extraordinarily ineffective and inefficient. Why is that? It's because the government was never meant to be a health insurance company. And it's trying to act like one. And not surprisingly, it's doing so very inefficiently and very ineffectively. You heard a couple of ideas from the Democrats that went before me basically tinkering around the system of Medicaid. I have a different idea, and it is a fundamental reform of Medicaid. I think that patients should be means tested and based on their means, I think that we should give premium assistance to patients so that they can purchase their own low-cost health insurance and get that out of the government control altogether because it does so very ineffectively and very inefficiently. What is going to be the outcome of doing that? Number one, we're going to have more cost-effective care. And by the way, those patients will be able to choose from a menu of insurance plans, of cost, low-cost health insurance plans. When we use that system, 
Number one, the health care will be more cost effective. Number two, the estimates are from the Illinois Policy Institute that we will save several billion dollars a year by doing this. And number three, we are going to improve access to care and thus quality of care. The Democrats before me, Governor Quinn and my op opponent in this primary have proposed slashing $2 billion from Medicaid. Everybody wants to decrease the cost of Medicaid, but just, de just slashing money from Medicaid doesn't get rid of any bills. Those bills are coming from an arrangement between the state and federal government and health care providers. They are agreeing to pay for services provided. When you just slash $2 billion from that program, you're just basically not paying your bills. We already have two and eight. First of all, there are $8 billion on a desk in Springfield of unpaid bills from last year. Two and a half billion of those are Medicaid bills. So when you just slash $2 billion from a system like that, then you've got four and a half billion dollars of unpaid bills. And what does that do? Well, if you don't pay your bills on time, the agreement is also that the interest rate starts to go up. So your cost, you don't get rid of the bills, you just pay them later and you pay a higher or interest rates. So your costs actually go up. And most important to me is that Medicaid reimburses so poorly that physicians, especially specialists, don't want to take Medicaid patients. I see this every day. And when you slash money from that system, you are worsening access to care, and as a result, you are harming patients. And I refuse to go along with that. Once again, we need to means test patients. Based on that means testing, we should give them premium support so they can go out and purchase their own low-cost health insurance. My second priority is pension reform. You've all heard about SB 512. Option number one is to pay less money and, I'm sorry, pay the same amount of money and get a lower benefit. Option number two is to pay more money to get the same benefit. Option number three is to go to a 401k type program. I think option number three is the only legitimate option. Why is that? Our legislators have manifestly demonstrated that they are irresponsible. Our pension fund is only 40% funded. You talk with people who work with pension funds, 90% is the minimum. Ours is 40%. That $86 billion you heard mentioned a few minutes ago is based on two assumptions. Number one, an 8% interest rate. Who's getting an 8% interest rate? Number two, it's based on actuarials from the 1970s. That $86 billion is more like $140 billion. Option number one and two aren't options because we have to take that money out of the control of our legislators and we have to put it into the control of individual employees. And we have to do that while we honor all the commitments that we've made to date. But going forward, we have to move strongly to a 401k type program for uh, employees to get that money out of the hand of the legislators. My third priority, please tell me if I'm going over my time. My third priority is to reverse the Democrats' tax increase. That was a record tax increase that went into effect last year. We lost in Illinois over 100,000 jobs last year alone after that tax increase. We have employers and employees going to other states that are more favorable from a tax standpoint. 100,000 jobs last year. Imagine what tax revenue went with those 100,000 jobs. And what did our, uh, our government do? 
when Caterpillar, when CME uh, started coming and asking for favors, they started doling out tax favor favors to those larger companies. I got news for you. 90 percent of the, of, the, uh, of the businesses in Illinois have five employees or left, less. So where do they go when their tax environment is unfavorable? The Democrat Senate candidates before me were talking about being selective as to where we give tax breaks. I think that's a fundamentally wrong approach. We need to make our state more attractive to businesses in general. How do we do that? We get rid of that tax increase, both on businesses as well as on individuals. Number two, we keep them as low as possible going forward. Number three, we do real workman's compensation uh, reform. You know what, people qualify for workman's comp awards if their injury doesn't even occur when it's at work. That's one of the reasons why we have some of the highest workman's comp insurance rates in the country. Number four, you heard tort reform talked about before. This is a horrible state for tort reform, for malpractice. <laughs> I know firsthand, what's the problem? Well, the problem is that it's not in the legislature. I, I've got some bad news for you today. It's not in the legislature. Our legislature has passed a tort reform three times. And all three times, our Supreme Court has reversed it. And we just re-upped three of those Supreme Court justices who voted in, fa in favor of reversing that law. This is the problem. Compensation for non-economic damages is out of control. We're not talking about people who get injured because of malpractice, and yes, malpractice occurs. Those patients deserve to be, uh, to be compensated. We're not talking about the money that they get for injuries or for lost employment or for whatever. We're talking about pain and suffering. And that's where the, the rewards in Cook County and somewhat in Lake County and Illinois in general are through the roof. And that's why we're paying so much money. So tort reform, what they're asking for is a cap. You name the cap. Is it 250,000? Is it 500,000? You name the cap, whatever you think is appropriate. Give the insurance company something to work with. Because if you don't, Rewards just go through the ceiling, 30, 40, 50 million dollars. They can't cope with that. And this all, the, the great majority of that comes from pain and suffering. But the problem is, unless we have a constitutional convention and change our constitution or, real, or elect new judges, um, we're stuck with what we have. I'm going to close by saying, Medicaid is our largest budget item in Illinois, and it needs to be fixed. Very soon, I think it's very likely that whether or not Obamacare is overturned, I think it's very likely that the federal government is going to be block granting Medicaid back to the states. In other words, they're going to send Medicaid dollars back to the states and say, you figure out what to do with it. When that happens, I think it would be very helpful to have a physician in the House, and I think it would be very helpful to have a physician in the Senate in the name of Dr. Ari Friedman, who is an excellent candidate, to help guide what health care reform should look like. There has never been a physician elected to the General Assembly in Illinois. Please help me change that. I would really appreciate your vote on March 20. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Neerhoff. I think in all fairness also, uh, well, first I will tell you that while Dr. Neerhoff was talking, I received a text message from uh, Lauren Torelli, who I had left a voicemail for. And she said an urgent matter had arisen over the weekend which precluded her from being here today. And she hoped to have other opportunities to meet uh, potential voters before the primary, which as you all, you all know is March 20th. And I, but I do think it's only fair that since um, you did take 
a, a substantial amount of time. And as you all know and are aware, he is not the only candidate running for the nomination from the Republican Party. But I think it's only fair to introduce Scott Drury, who is running unopposed on the Democratic side for the same uh, coast. So if you would stand up and everybody can say, and you can, and now, all right. We do have time until before the 10th Congressional District debate is going to be starting, so you certainly should mingle and meet the candidates that are here. Uh, take advantage of any refreshment that you might feel like having, and uh, we'll call you back to order very soon. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Cindy Canary, and I'm pleased to be moderating this debate this afternoon. If everyone will take their seats, we will get started. Well, I am moderating um, on behalf of the League of Women Voters. I'm moderating the second debate this afternoon for the 10th Congressional District. Um, I am going to quickly run through the rules that were agreed upon by the candidates um, prior to today's event, and um, then we will get started. First of all, the League has selected a moderator, me, um, from out of the district. Um, the candidates will each get a minute and a half to make their opening remarks. Um, right before we came in here, we drew lots to see in what order people would go. Um, Vivek Bhavda will go first. Vivek, I'm very sorry. As you can tell, I'm out of the district. Um, the um, second uh, candidate will be John Tree, the third Brad Schneider, and the fourth Ilya Shaman. Um, after that, we will take written questions from the audience. Um, those questions will be brought up to me, and um, I will be able to review them, put them in order. If, you're, if we have six questions on one thing, we may try to rearrange it a little bit to make sure that we cover a variety of topics. Um, the candidates will each get one minute to answer the questions, and we will kind of move on so that the first person doesn't start first every time. can get a little confusing, so keep me honest up here. Um, candidate statements will be timed by the league. We have a timer up in the front. And when we finally get to the closing statements, each candidate will be given one minute. Um, no visual aids are permitted. Um, this is a nonpartisan event, so no campaign paraphernalia in here. Um, and the League, as you know, the League of Women Voters is the sponsor of this debate. And um, with that, I think we can begin. Um, Mr. Um, Bavda. 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 <laughs> Excuse me, a minute and a half, yes. Good afternoon, folks. My name is Vivek Bavda, and I'm running for Congress from the 10th District. First of all, thank you all for coming out tonight. And I also want to thank the League of Women Voters for putting on this wonderful event. And I want to thank the moderator as well for volunteering her time. You know, the first question that I get asked when I tell people I'm running for office is, why are you running? Well, the answer for me is simple. It's my parents. They left India in the 1970s to come to this country. They left behind their friends and family to seek a better life for themselves and eventually me. They took this risk because they believed in America, each person has opportunity. But in America, each person is only limited by her dreams and how hard she's willing to work to achieve them. But those beliefs that there is so much for are being shaken, and not by the people of this country, but by those in Washington. And over the last few years, I've been struck when people say, let's take our country back. This is just the wrong way to think about things. What makes America great, what drew my parents and countless others here, is that America always moves forward, leading the way. Be it healthcare, technology, or human rights, it's our consistent forward progress that makes us what we are, a guiding light to the world. But we've got to move this country forward, though, we've got to create jobs. We've got to make education a civil right. And we've got to break apart the too big to fail banks that blew up the economy. I look forward to working with you 
to earn your vote, to earn your support, and moving this country forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bavda. Uh, Mr. Tree. I'm very excited to be here today. The fact is, our nation's future is at stake. There's an election about the future, and our future has never been more frightening to me. When I sit there and look at the partisanship that's going on in Congress, where Republicans and Democrats are throwing rocks at each other, and instead of working on American solutions, they continue to shut down the government. It's so discouraging and appalling to me that I got into this race. I have lived all around the world. My father was born and raised into the Air Force. I went to the Air Force Academy. 22 years ago, I graduated from the Air Force Academy, and I'm a colonel in the Air Force today in the reserves. I work out at the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. a couple days a month. I also have an MBA in marketing and a master's degree in economics, and I've worked for Procter & Gamble and Kellogg's. I was the brand manager of Rice Krispies Treats and Nutrigrain bars and Special K bars for the nation. So I've worked in the biggest companies. I've also been the president of a small granola company with 20 employees struggling to make payroll. And I can tell you that we need a better way to do business in America. We need to send a member to Congress that can get things done that can reach across the aisle and can find a common American ground to things because the partisanship that has really threatened our country has gone too far. And that's why I'm running for Congress, is to oppose that. Thank you very much, Mr. Tree. Mr. Schneider? Thank you. And I want to thank the Union League Club, the League of Women Voters, for having us here tonight. Uh, my lifetime in politics, such that it is, really starts with the League of Women Voters. I remember as a young boy going with my mother to these types of events. So it's kind of exciting for me to be here. Uh, let me tell you how I come to be here. I live in Deerfield. We've been in Deerfield since 1990. I've spent my entire adult life in this district. My wife was born in Glencoe. We've raised our kids here, made our career here. Uh, this is our home. As our kids, we have a freshman in college, about to be 19, a junior in high school, as they leave the protection of our home, the protective custody of our oversight, and go in and enter the world, the world they are, they are inheriting, that their generation in, is inheriting, is not nearly the world that we had hoped to give them when we started a family nearly 20 years ago. They deserve better, we deserve better, and most importantly, I think we can do better. I'm running for Congress because as John touched on, we have not just gridlock, but ossification in Congress. Nothing can get done at a time when there are so many challenges facing this country and this world, at a time when the world needs American leadership. Congress is focused on the most minute of solutions, not even addressing the grand problems we face. I'm running for Congress because I think I have the experience and the skills to tackle these challenges challenges and make sure what we pass on to the next generation is the same promise that was passed on to me when I started 50 years ago. Thank you very much. Mr. Shaman? Uh, well, my name is Ilya Shaman. I, too, am running for Congress here in the 10th Congressional District. And my journey here actually began about 21 years ago this January, when my family came to this country as Jewish refugees from the former Soviet Union. Through hard work, support from our community and government, we were able to find security, stability, even prosperity, right here in the 10th Congressional District. Yet when I look out at our communities today, as our team of over 500 volunteers knocks on doors and make phone calls, we hear every single day that that American dream that my family lived out is slipping further and further out of reach. And when I look out at Washington, D.C., I see a Republican Party that block by block is dismantling the foundations that made middle class lives like mine and so many of yours a reality. And at the same time, I see a Democratic Party that far too often fails to stand up and fight back for the values I believe will make a real difference in people's lives. So I am in this race to focus on how we put people back to work, how we restore some fairness to our tax code, and how we invest in America again. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here today. I'm grateful for the opportunity to answer your questions. And I'm confident together, not only can we win this race, but we can build a movement to rebuild our crumbling middle class and restore the American dream that made all our lives here a reality. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Now we will start with your questions. And the first person to answer this question will be Mr. Tree, and then we'll go on. Um, the question is, why do you believe you are the best candidate to beat Representative Bob Dole in November? I have a good name. <laughs> we had eight years of Bush, and now it's time for a tree. <laughs> if you vote for a tree, you love the environment. And for the tree huggers out there, I'm available afterwards if you want to hug a tree. But uh, seriously, those are the funny parts. But the fact is, 
I'm a lifelong public servant already. I've served in the Air Force for 22 years, like I said. I love this country. I've served under presidents of both parties, Republican and Democrat. In business, at, at Procter & Gamble and at Kellogg's and in small businesses, I've seen the economy from every angle. And I can match up with Bob Dole in the fall. This election is about winning this seat for the Democrats in my mind. As a Democrat, I hope that you believe that I will say that. But the fact is, we need to win. We need to win by appealing to our Democrat base and also by appealing to the middle. And I can do that because I bring common sense, I bring the military, I bring civilian business, and a great attitude. And I'm funny. <laughs> Mr. Schneider. Paul Begala starts his column this week in Newsweek quoting Bill Clinton saying elections are won and lost in the middle. This election in particular, this district in particular, that's the truth. We are now with the redistricting with new lines considered a D plus eight district. That's roughly 34% Democrat, 26% Republican. That's the 8% spread. But 40% of this district is independent, is that middle. I believe I'm the best candidate to take on Bob Dole because I believe I'm the best one with a chance to unite our base and the Democratic Party with the middle to get things done. I think what I bring to this race is my experience, 30 years of work experience. I've been an employee and a boss. I've owned businesses. For the last 16 years, I've worked with family businesses, helping them grow, helping them reach their dreams, add employees, and build for a long-term success, sustainability. I think that's, again, some of the things we need to focus on in the coming election. I think where Bob Dold is going to talk about his strengths, his experience with business, I can say my, my experience is broader and deeper. When we talk about issues, I think he's wrong and I'm right. Thank you very much. Mr. Shaman? You know, when you run against an incumbent, the case we have to make to voters across this district is to fire Congressman Dolt, a congressman who voted to end Medicare as we know it, a congressman who says we should raise the Social Security retirement age, a congressman who voted to defund Planned Parenthood, and who has failed to introduce a single piece of legislation to put people back to work. Our campaign has the best ability to win this race because we present a clear contrast with the policies of Congressman Dolt. I'm running a, a campaign based on conviction and values, that if you're willing to stand up with backbone and conviction for that which built the middle class, you can win. And what that says is we reach out to Democrats and Republicans, not on the social issues that divide us, but on the bread and butter economic issues that bring us together. How do you get a good job that pays your bills, allows you to have a secure retirement, send your kid to college? When we focus on those issues, when we organize around them, we build what we've built for the past 11 months. A campaign powered by 550 volunteers, fueled by over 14,000 donors, and getting broad support and deep support all across the district because people know exactly where we stand and what I'll fight for in Congress. Thank you. Mr. Bavda. I'm the best candidate and the best person to beat Bob Dole because of my biography. I'm the, I'm the most diverse set of work experiences anyone up, who has anyone up here. You know, I, went, I grew up in the district. I know it like the back of my hand. I worked for the Federal Reserve as an analyst when I was there, so I have no economic policy. My economic experience beats Bob Stoltz. Uh, I also did Teach for America out in Compton, California. I know what it takes to educate all children. That beats Bob Dold. I was a public finance consultant, so I know how to build support for infrastructure projects, like we need to create jobs, and that beats Bob Dold. I also know how, what it takes to put together a campaign. When I was a consultant for Coro, I prevented a ban on stem cell research in Missouri. I know what it takes to beat right-wing extremists like Bob Dold. I've also had trouble finding a job after I got my law degree, so I know just how hard this recession is. And I can connect to voters and tell people that it's, it's not their fault. We just need to make things a little bit easier so that all of us can work. So these experiences, these, this biography, and the fact that the, the direct contrast of me making government work for all of us Thank will you. make the difference. Thank you very much. Um, we will start this question with Mr. Schneider. And the question is, will you accept PAC contributions from either unions, businesses, or other entities? The short answer is yes. I have accepted PAC contributions. Uh, this is a, an expensive campaign. Last time, uh, Mr. Seals, Mr. Dole both raised uh, almost $3 million. This time it's going to be more expensive. This time we're facing the threat of super PACs coming in, the Koch brothers, Carl Rove. There will be a, a lot of need for resources to get our message out. Uh, there are rules and about quantity and transparency in all PAC contributions. You will know who I receive money from. No money I receive will carry any extra weight. Uh, my message will always be my message. My decisions will reflect the values and the interests of the people of the 10th District, period. Nothing more. Thank you. Mr. Shaman. 
uh, a PAC is an organization of educators or people with a similar interest who come together to lobby on their own behalf. For example, the Illinois Federation of Teachers represents over 100,000 educators in the state. Normal PAC contributions are subject to limits of how much someone can give and to full transparency of all contributions. Now, our campaign is taking a step further. We actually report all our contributions, even under $200. So you can see where every penny we get comes from. However, as a result of the Citizens United decision by the Supreme Court, there's now a new animal out there called super PACs. These can take unlimited contributions from corporations and individuals. When it comes to super PACs, I have been clear from day one that I will tell super PACs from the left and the right to stay out of this race. I'll encourage Congressman Dole to do the same thing because the reality is the electoral process should belong to people, not big corporations. But when it comes to regular PACs, they represent our constituents. I think it's important they have a voice in the process as well. Thank you. Mr. Bavda. I will take money from PACs, but I do think that our campaign finance system is broken. And what I propose to do is to completely make it over. We need to take the first $50 of every citizen's tax money and allow them to give it to the president or a school board member or anyone in between. This will make people more, it'll make our politicians more accountable to each and every one of us because we're all contributors. It will allow grassroots campaigns to become more viable and, more, and make it more of a reality. If we do this, we can radically change the way that money corrupts politics because we can also reduce the, the limits on the contributions. Again, making everyone, making us all accountable to the voters, not to the 0.5% of the country that donates to political campaigns. I, I will and have accepted PAC money. Like it's been said up here, PACs are organized movements that believe in certain ideals and they share their money with candidates that they believe are birds of a feather. And I have taken PAC money from different veterans groups, for example, nationally, as well as others. But I do decry the super PAC movement. And the fact is this billions of dollars that flow into the election, really unmonitored and unchecked, are creating havoc with our electoral system. I look forward to the day where those are outlawed. I don't believe, though, with Ilya, that you can simply ask the Republicans to stay out of this race, and they will, because Karl Rove and others, the Koch brothers, they want to retain this seat. It's going to be messy. It's going to be bloody. It's a blood sport, really, already. Just the four of us, but we're nice to each other. The fact is, <laughs> once you have a nominee going up against Bob Dole, it's going to be a knuckle fight all the way to the end and the super PACs are gonna come, and we're gonna need to respond. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Schneider. You already went. Oh, you I'm first. sorry. I answered. <laughs> Same answer. <laughs> great, great. Sure? It, was, it was a quiz. <laughs> um, our next question is on Social Security. It is a three-part question, but perhaps think about it broadly in terms of Social Security. Would you consider raising the Social Security retirement age to 70 increasing the Social Security tax from 6.2 to 6.7 percent and increasing the income subject to the Social Security tax to $200,000. Um, start with Mr. Shaman. Uh, no, no, and yes are the answers, and I'll tell you why. When I look at Social Security, I see a system that's kept generations of seniors out of poverty, and more importantly, in 2008, when the economy went off a cliff, when 401ks disappeared overnight, Social Security paid out every single penny that was earned and did so without contributing a nickel to the deficit because it is by law not, contribute, not allowed to contribute to the deficit. So when I look at Social Security, I think we have to preserve benefits for current retirees and future retirees as well. Now, right now, Social Security can pay out 100% of benefits till 2036. If we want to deal with the problem long term, I support eliminating the cap on what percentage of income is subject to Social Security entirely and if we take that simple step, so somebody who makes $100 million a year no longer pays the same into Social Security as somebody who makes $110,000 a year, we will guarantee Social Security can pay out full benefits for generations to come without trying to balance the budget on the backs of seniors and people who have worked for decades and thought they'd earn the secure retirement that they were entitled to. Mr. Bobta. No, no, and yes. We need to save Social Security. There's three things we can do to ensure that it stays forever. First, I agree that we need to remove the cap on the income subject to the payroll tax. That takes us most of the way there. Two, we've got to make sure we have an accurate cost of inflation me uh, excuse me, measure. And finally, we need to encourage legal immigration to expand the base that would support Social Security. 
But uh, as I said before, I've fought the right-wing extremists. I refuse to allow Social Security to be gutted by the Republicans. You can count on me to always be in, in your behind you to make sure Social Security is preserved. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tree. Yes, the, uh, that's not my answer. No, <laughs> no, no, yes is the answer. But the bottom line is one of the reasons why I'm running in this race is to protect the promises that the government has made to its people. I was out at the Pentagon last summer when the hard right Tea Party was threatening to shut the government down over the refusal to raise the debt ceiling. And I had to be part of an unfortunate team that needed to prepare communication plans to our men and women on active duty that they wouldn't get paid, that we would accrue their wages and send them some make good check down the road. Meanwhile, the men and women on active duty are living month to month, paycheck to paycheck. And I found that morally, irre morally reprehensible. The same on Social Security. I will fight against people that try to balance the budget on the backs of Social Security on senior citizens. I'm against raising the age for the entitlement. I'm against raising the contribution on taxes, but I will definitely lift the cap on the contribution so that, like it's already been said, all the way up to $100 million, a billion dollars, they're going to pay the same rate as everyone else. Thank you. Mr. Schneider. We're all going to have the same answer here. We can't raise the age. We are, we're at a point now where there are people, I uh, have a friend who's a tile layer. He's 57 years old. His knees have given out. Working longer for most of these professions, most of these trades, uh, 65 is hard enough to reach. 67 is going to be a stretch. We have to recognize that we can't raise the age. Raising the percent of income, that's t the percentage tax to 6.7 percent puts the onus on the people who can afford it the least. We need to put the burden on the people who can afford it the most. And that's why I think across the board we've all said take off the cap, have all income uh, eligible and taxed for um, Social Security. At the same time, I think there are more things that we can do. It's not my idea, but this is the type of thinking I like. Someone who has a high net worth, someone who doesn't need their Social Security monthly check to make their ends meet, who's just going to put it into savings or investment, let the government hold on to that money. Someone with that high net worth is going to pay an estate tax. Upon their death, let them take an equal credit on their estate tax. Thank you. Um, and um, if anyone has questions, there are league volunteers walking around. You can hand them your index card. Um, our next question begins with Mr. Bavda, and that is, what is your position regarding drilling for oil and gas on federal lands? Well, I'd, I believe we need to protect the environment. Where, we, where it is environmentally safe to drill for, for oil, we should do so. We're steadily on our way to becoming, uh, becoming energy efficient within 10 years or so, especially with natural gas and the other resources that we have. There was an article in the New York Times this morning. But more importantly than uh, drilling for more oil, it's about making sure we're, we're saving the environment, making sure that we're addressing climate change, making sure that we have a cap and trade system on greenhouse gases, that we're investing in alternative energy. We're investing in battery cars or electric batteries for electric cars so that we're reducing our dependence, reducing oil use c at all uh, so, so that we have a clean environment. Thank you, Mr. Tree. I stand with the environment. You can't have a last name like tree and be against the environment. I'm with the environment. I oppose the drilling in federal lands. It's just heartbreaking what happened in the Gulf of Mexico, as we all know, and we're still recovering from that and will be for many, many years to come. As a planet, we've already exceeded the biological com carrying capacity of the Earth to sustain the number of people on the planet without being more smart about how we do business, without fostering sustainability, without worrying about what I, as a businessman, call the triple bottom line, which is where you focus on not just profit, but on people and on the planet. And so we need to take all these things into consideration. It's very tempting to be short-sighted and say, yeah, drill for oil because we want to lower the price of gas or we want to put people to work. But we need to be able to balance that along with the people and the planet that are affected by those decisions. Thank you. Mr. Schneider. So I'm going to break the question into two pieces. We need to always exploit, explore and extract energy uh, from our lands. But we can't do it in places where we can't, can't do it safely. We should never, ever drill for oil in Lake Michigan. We should not be drilling for oil in Anwar. We need to make sure wherever we do it, we can do it soundly and safely. At the same time, there's a second half to the question, which is how do we charge for the use of federal lands? Oil companies drilling on federal lands should not pay a subsidized price. They should pay the same market price as if they were drilling across the fence in private lands. 
farmers, ranchers who are grazing their herds on public lands should pay the same price as if they were grazing their herds on private lands. We subsidize countless industries in this country, charging re reduced or lower or almost no fees for federal lands. It's a source of income to reduce our deficits. We should be charging the fair market value for those lands. Thank you. Mr. Shaman. You know, anyone who's driven to work over the past week or two has noticed gas prices have gone up 30 or 40 cents. And it's tempting to think that more drilling for oil is somehow the solution. So the Republicans play off that every time. They say, drill here, drill now, or else you're trying to raise the cost of just getting to work every day. The reality is we have a global oil market. Simply doing more drilling on U.S. federal lands will contribute very little to gas prices going down and do so at the expense of our most crit critical natural resources, whether in Anwar, whether using new drilling techniques in the Gulf, where we put the whole area in danger, or in the Keystone Pipeline, where we put in danger most of our water supply. So the reality is this, I oppose drilling in federal land. But more importantly, we need to create a new clean energy, renewable energy portfolio, find alternatives to relying on fossil fuels. Because ultimately our energy security, our national security, and our economic security depend on weaning ourselves off fossil fuels and moving to a new clean energy economy. That's the opportunity and the challenge before us today. And it presents a unique opportunity to bring together labor, the environmental movement, and corporations to develop a vision for a new clean energy Thank economy. You. Um, Mr. Tree, um, should employees be required to, should employers, excuse me, be required to offer health care insurance? How much and to whom? Well, yes, they do. I mean, it's the law now. That's the, uh, the, the fact is universal health care is something that we have fought for and toiled over for a very long time. And so, yes, uh, we need to offer health care. It's appalling to me that we have different health care systems to where the rich get a better health care treatment than the poor and the less fortunate. And so I'm thrilled with the progress that we've made with our health care progress. There is still progress to be made. President Obama spent a good first two years of his presidency working on getting this done and getting it compromised a little bit in the Congress. And so in these next four years, with President Obama at the helm and with a Democratic controlled House and Senate, I look forward to working to improving what we've already got thus far. Thank you very much. Mr. Schneider. I think we most definitely need to continue the, beyond the first step of broad, full, comprehensive health care reform. Uh, I owned a business and I took over business in 1997. We had, at that point, eight employees. Our health care bill, our health insurance, we provide full health care insurance for all of our employees. Our health insurance premiums went up double digits percent every year. I sold that business in 2003. The Affordable Care Act that was passed in 2009 was a step forward. What we have faced since then is an unwillingness by, an unwillingness by the people in Washington to sit down and say, how do we take what we like about affordable care, keep, keep pushing it forward, where do we see some changes that are necessary, make those changes, and take more steps forward. No major reform such as health care is going to happen in one fell swoop. We need to take three steps forward, sometimes a step back to make two, two steps forward again. We need complete comprehensive health care reform. Thank you, Mr. Shaman. You know, right before I ran for Congress, I served as the National Mobilization Director for a group called MoveOn.org where my job was to organize 5 million people to fight for real health care reform. And yes, we made some progress, giving 30 million people more access, doubling the number of community health centers, providing coverage for preventative care. But the reality is we still have a problem with our health care system, and the problem is we put the burden on small and medium businesses to cover the cost of their employer's care when they can't afford it. That's one of many problems. So I differ from the other candidates here in that I support moving towards Medicare for all Americans. The way to fix our health care system in the long term, to reduce costs for individuals, for small businesses, and the government, is to let more and more people access Medicare, creating a broader risk pool, having the young and the healthy in the same insurance plan as the elderly and the sick. If we do that, we will have a system that actually makes it so that it's no longer like it is today, where the insurance companies have you when you're young and healthy and cheap, and the taxpayer pays for you when you're expensive. That's the difference in this race. I think we have to fight for Medicare for all Americans. That starts right now by fighting to put a public option into the system so anyone can buy into Medicare. Mr. Bavda. I support and applaud the President's Affordable Care Act. I think it's a, it's a birthright. Making health care a civil right is exactly what we should do, and we've done that. But as the President has said, we need to bend the cost curve, and that requires doing several things. For reforming Medicare, reforming, we need to allow Medicare to negotiate bulk drug rate prices to lower costs. 
we need to use a form of competitive bidding called the reverse Dutch auction to lower payments. If we do these things in Medicare, we can dramatically lower the cost, and we could actually expand those competitive bidding uh, features to the regular insurance market. I also believe the Affordable Care Act's experiments in bundle care and economy care organizations will bring health care costs down in, in the long term. I think it's a, we need to fully implement and fully support the president. It will go a long way towards making sure that we can keep health care as a civil right till the end of time. Thank you. We'll start this question with Mr. Schneider. And that is, what plan do you favor for immigration reform? I again think we need comprehensive immigration reform. We need to pe bring people from out of the shadows, people who are today actively and positively contributing to our economy. We need to make sure that these people have a pathway to full citizenship, but a pathway that doesn't prejudice those people who have waited outside, waited in line. I think we can do that. I think as people, as human, uh, caring for others, we have the ability and the sophistication to come up with a plan to address just that. Thank you very much. You know, when it comes to immigration, we have about 12 million people living in the shadows right now. They work, they pay taxes, often in, without actually collecting Social Security afterwards. They pay sales taxes when they buy things. They drive on the roads, they go to uh, centers of worship and to schools. Oftentimes, that setup doesn't just hurt those families, it hurts people who are here legally. Because if you ever get into a car crash with somebody who's undocumented, doesn't have a license, doesn't have an insurance, that hurts both people. I think the status quo is unacceptable. I think we have to pass comprehensive immigration reform. That starts with the DREAM Act that says if you came here as a child, often not even speaking your native language, and you want to serve this country in the military and college, you should get citizenship. But it also means passing comprehensive reform that, one, provides a pathway to citizenship for the 12 million people here who haven't committed a serious crime. Number two, that actually holds corporations accountable for taking advantage of these immigrants and paying them below prevailing or minimum wages because we know they won't complain. And number three, I do think we have to secure the border so we don't come back to this problem in 10 or 20 years. Immigrants have built this country. This isn't about charity. It's about getting the best and the brightest to come to America. Thank you. Mr. Bavda. I believe in comprehensive immigration reform. I believe that the undocumented, for all intents and purposes, are Americans, even though they broke the law to become Americans. We need to provide a pathway to citizenship. This includes paying a fine, learning English, learning civics of the United States. And that if we could do that, we can go a long way towards solving our immigration problem. I also believe that we have to pass the DREAM Act. But even more so, we need to increase legal immigration. The reality is that we need a larger base to support Medicare, Social Security, and government programs. And even beyond this, talking again about comprehensive immigration reform, we need to track employers to make sure that they're not hiring, the, after we pass the reform, new, new illegal immigrants. And we've got to track overstays on visas so people can't stay in the country longer than they should. But finally, I'll close on the Clinton-Bush scholarship I like to call. We should invite a thousand people from around the world to come and learn and become citizens here, become job creators, attract the best talent from the entire world to make sure that, just like we do with the Rhodes Scholarship, and this, will, this comprehensive immigration reform will do well for us. Thank you. Mr. Trade. Like the others, I support a comprehensive immigration reform policy. Immigration is such a divisive, emotional issue. When you go around and talk to men and women in the tent and they say, an illegal, and they use that word, an illegal took my job, I can't get work because they're lost to people that were willing to work for less money. So you have a group of people that build up a hatred toward illegal aliens, as they say, versus undocumented. You have employers that like to take advantage of the situation, like has been mentioned, because they can pay them below market wages because they know they'll get no pushback. But nobody wins in this game. It's an emotional issue that nobody wins. Our country is great because of the diversity of our population, and we need to pass the DREAM Act. We need to get people on the road to citizenship. We need to make sure that we don't let them cut in line like it's been said for people that have already been here in the process, but we need to include everyone and get them on the path to citizenship where they're paying taxes, where they're participating, and where they can enjoy the full benefits of being a United States citizen. Thank you very much. Um, for our next question, we'll start with Mr. Shaman. And the question is, how do you feel about a two-state solution for Israel and a Palestinian state? Sure, this is a critical issue, especially in this district, because it's not just policy, it's personal. Many families like mine actually have family living in Israel. You know, I mentioned at the beginning my family came here as Jewish refugees from the Soviet Union. The second half of my family went off to Israel, lives in Haifa to this day, has lived through decades of struggle, conflict, and yes, success in Israel. 
So my fierce belief is that we need a Jewish homeland in the state of Israel where my people can live in peace, security, democracy, and prosperity. And that the only way to get there is to have two states for two people living side by side in peace and security. Now I think the important piece here is this, that the only way we get there is through direct final status negotiations between the two sides. Because their leaders have to go back to their people and have the legitimacy they need. Now the U.S. does have a role to play in that. A member of Congress from the 10th District has a role to play in that in helping foster the political will for the two sides to come to the table and reach that final status agreement. But we must always may remember that that agreement must come from them. It can't be imposed from the outside, whether it's from the United States or the United Nations. Thank you. Mr. Bobda. I do believe in a two-state solution. I think Israel must remain democratic and Jewish. I consider myself a strong friend of Israel. And in, in working with the Israelis, we've got to make sure that this limbo that we're currently in doesn't continue. The reality is if population trends continue, Israel will no longer remain Jewish, and that's not an acceptable option. And so we must engage in a two-state solution, even if it isn't a perfect system, in order to maintain the character of the country. Uh, we, we, I do believe that direct negotiations must take place, that it, it's truly a, a something that needs to be resolved on the negotiation table between the U.S. and Palestinians. And I think it's important to remember the United States' role should be to provide military aid to Israel to, to safeguard it from not just the Palestinians, but from the wider Middle East. But I think we also have to provide massive economic aid to the Palestinians. Because the reality is, it's just like a gangbanger on the streets of Chicago who sees no future in his life. You have a Palestinian feeling the same way, and only economic aid can put a, put yeah. them, give them a future and allow for Thank Middle you. East peace. Thank you very much. Mr. Tree. Israel is our country's premier and best and most reliable ally in the Middle East. When I was an active duty captain over in Italy where I was assigned for three years in the 1990s, I traveled to Israel 12 different times and spent four months boots on the ground working with the Israeli Air Force all over that tiny little country and worked with them on collaborating with the United States Air Force on how to improve their security. Like I know their security firsthand. I've been to these classified bases that are phenomenal. And the fact is they need a two-state solution and we need to be champions of a two-state solution to where they can work out the terms of their peace and they, Isra the, the country, the state of Israel needs to know that the United States will not abandon them. We will continue our foreign aid and we will stand by them as they work out a two-state solution. Thank you, Mr. Schneider. I think one thing that's for certain is that in the 10th District, the representative of Congre in Congress will always be a friend to Israel. That's clear. From the 10th District, there is, I think, uniform consensus that a two-state solution, as President Obama said last spring, a Jewish state, a homeland for the Jewish people in Israel, and a Palestinian state, a homeland for the Palestinians living in peace, in prosperity, side by side with Israel, is the only way to go. I think more importantly is that the United States have a broad, robust foreign policy beyond just the Israel-Palestinian conflict. We see today that the flashpoint is in Syria. Syria may default into a, a civil war. You're going to have the Druze on the south, the Kurds on the north. You're in between, you're going to have the Sunnis, the Shiites, and the Alawites fighting each other. That's going to create a great sense of conflict, a great sense of catastrophe that will then spread into Lebanon where Hezbollah has 40,000 to 50,000 rockets pointed at Israel, will, will affect the relationships with Iran, who is threatening today Israel with nuclear annihilation. We need a broad, bold foreign policy. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, our next question will start with Mr. Bavda. Um, what should the federal role in housing finance be, and what kinds of reforms would you support? First of all, the housing is a critical section of our economy. And right now, we have way too many Americans who are underwater, thanks in part to Wall Street and excesses on Wall Street, excesses by banks. In order to make sure that we have a fluid housing market, a liquid housing market where people aren't underwater, I propose that we take, for example, if you took out a mortgage for $150,000 and now your home is underwater at $100,000, that we reduce the principal to 120% of fair market value to $120,000. Why should we do this? Again, it will create liquidity in the housing market so people can buy and sell homes. It'll, it'll, create, it'll increase home prices for everyone. The banks will get more money than rather than foreclosing because people are just walking away from these homes. And only with a sustained and recovered housing market can we hope for continued economic growth in the larger economy as well. Thank you. Mr. Tree. 
Yes, the reckless greed in Wall Street precipitated this meltdown across Main Street and the housing bubble that went with it. When you deregulated the financial sector, because the Republicans and their zeal to deregulate sit there and say, if we just cut the government enough and make it as small as possible and regulate as little as possible, except in women's health, then everything will be okay. That's what they really believe. So they deregulated the finance industry and you had reckless greed run amok across all of Main Street. So Chris Dodd was put into place to help re-regulate what was once regulated and the Republicans are now chipping away at that. They are trying to water it down and take it apart little by little. So the federal government needs to strengthen that. They need to regulate and put the rules in place for the finance and Wall Street industry to be able to obey and learn and that the deterrent for it be severe enough to where they won't have a repeat of what happened over the last few years. Thank you. I think a lot of the people who are in homes that are today underwater need as much as anything just the time for the, to get out from underwater. A lot of them have homes with mortgages that they, if they, they have the wherewithal to continue to pay except for the ballooning of those mortgages. It might have been a three or a seven year arm. We need to help with the banks and the consumers to give them the credibility, the, the, I'm sorry, the ability to work out a, a, a settled price as, as uh, Vivek talked about that allows the losses to be taken and shared and distributed part within the bank part within the homeowner and part within the rest of us. It's a, we have too many homes underwater. Chicago is bad, Nevada is a disaster. It's a, it's a national challenge we face across the country. We need to have people staying in their homes, paying their mortgage as best they can. At the same time, some people unfortunately are not gonna be able to get out from underwater. Time's not what they need, but they need help finding a new home, whether it's moving into an apartment. But the most important thing we have to do is get the economy growing, getting people working again, getting jobs again, so people can start paying mortgages again. Thank you, Mr. Shaman. Right now, across the 10th district, we have about one in four home mortgages underwater. And whereas that started in communities like Waukegan and North Chicago, it's now spreading further and further, places like Highland Park, like Buffalo Grove, places where people were holding out on savings, able to pay their mortgages, but now those are running out. So the reality is we probably haven't hit rock bottom yet. So I do think there is a robust federal government role to play in this process. I support a proposal by Senator Durbin for something called cram down. That says, number one, banks must engage in mandatory mediation with homeowners before they go to foreclosure. Number two, that bankruptcy judges can require the principal on your mortgage to be brought down. Because the reality is oftentimes you're not just waiting for your next job, the reality is your home value might never go up to the level it was before. I think we have to reduce not just the interest, but the principal. And number three, I think we have to have a recognition that foreclosures don't just hurt the family, they hurt the entire community and house prices there as well. So we have to have a federal government commitment to making sure people can stay in their homes. And that starts with passing jobs legislation so people have the money they need to pay their mortgages. Thank you very much. This question will begin with Mr. Tree. Um, what is your view on federal impact aid to schools in communities near military bases? I love it. The, uh, my mom's a school teacher and I told you I was born and raised into the Air Force. I moved 18 different times by the time I went to the Air Force Academy. At age 18, I had lived 18 different places, three different high schools in three different states, on military bases, off of military bases. And the fact is my mom found a job and just taught wherever she went. And largely, you have a transient population like I just described, military moving all the time. They don't have the same benefits as a more stable population that doesn't move. Federal impact aid to military schools is critical. Public financing of education is critical. I'm for education. We haven't had a pure education question only. This is just with federal impact to the military, but just know we need to invest federal dollars into education. We need to strengthen our public education system to make it viable so that it's not nickel and dimed away with vouchers that are going off to private schools. We need to shore up our public education system. Thank you, Mr. Schneider. I had a mentor early in my career who told me, always look and make sure there are no shortfalls or windfalls. Impact aid in this country, especially in this district, is a problem of, of a shortfall. The U.S. military pays for its students attending schools in North Chicago and Waukegan about $6,000. The cost to educate those kids is significantly greater. Consequently, those school districts are effectively subsidizing the, the people like John when he was a student as, who are families who are serving our country, putting them sometimes in the most 
economically challenged school districts. We need to make sure that impact aid covers the full cost of educating our children. We may need to make sure that those military, children of military service people are getting the best education possible, that they're contributing to the, the communities they live in, and that the other kids in those communities also get the best education possible. Education in this country cannot, should not be a function of what zip code you're born in or if you're moving from base to base to base. We need to make sure that impact aid matches the real cost of educating our kids. Thank you. Mr. Shaman. You know, this is an issue right here in Highland Park, as many of you know, that we have the federal government doing about five to 6000 when we know it costs fourteen, fifteen, or $16,000 a year to educate a child in that school district. And that taxpayers in Highland Park and in Deerfield end up bearing the cost of it because the military isn't doing its part. I think we have to make sure that the military contributes as much as it costs to educate an average child in that community. That's roughly fourteen, fifteen, sixteen thousand $16,000 a year. Now, part of it is the current impact aid is actually expiring, so we have to make sure it doesn't disappear. And part of it is we have to bring it up to the level of educating a child. But this speaks more broadly to the fact that our federal budget is actually a statement of our moral values. You know, right now we are often unwilling to invest the fourteen or fifteen thousand dollars a year cost to educate a child, but we are willing to spend twenty or twenty-one or twenty-two thousand dollars a year to incarcerate them after they fail to get a world-class education and don't have the economic opportunities they need. I think that has to change. On the federal level, we have to focus on educating our students and creating the ladders of opportunity that everyone in this room probably had. Thank you, Mr. Bavda. All children deserve the opportunity to attain an excellent education. When it comes to impact aid, for sure. But let's look at the broader education picture. The, the reality is that we need to bring our funding levels up to new trier, not to bring new trier down in any sh shape or form or Glencoe down. We've got to radically change the way we educate our children. We need to make sure that we have mandatory early childhood education, that we reform no, ch no child left behind to make sure that we're teaching to tests that we're worth teaching to, incentivizing learning through a growth model, and uh, and making sure we have well-trained, well-funded, and accountable educators. When it comes to college, we need to, take, we need to invest in our community colleges. We have to remember that education is an investment in us and children, and our children. So we need to make sure that tuition costs go up in accordance with how much the education improves our, our income level. If we do all these th three things, all these four things, we can radically change education and we can make sure all children have the opportunity to attain an excellent education. Thank you. And we'll start this question with Mr. Schneider. When the Bush tax cuts expire, what would you like to see? One, extend the program or write a new program, and if so, what should that new program look like? The Bush tax cuts expire this December. We should absolutely not extend them. We need to rewrite our entire tax code. We need to start fresh. We need to have a tax code that is fair, that does not put the greatest burden on the people who can afford it the least. I believe in a progressive tax. Those of us who have more should carry more of the burden. But I don't believe in a redistribution of wealth. This is a fair distribution of responsibility. All of us in this country have a stake in this game, a stake in our future, and all of us should feel a part of that. I believe we can work to eliminate virtually most, if not almost all, of our tax expenditures. I would start from scratch. I would not eliminate the mortgage home deduction, the mortgage interest deduction. I would not eliminate the charitable interest deduction. But after that, I would look at each one from scratch. Does it make sense today? Many of these expenditures put in place in the 1930s may have made sense then, but I don't think they necessarily are going to make sense in 2012. There's roughly 600 to $800 billion of tax expenditures that we can eliminate. Thank you. Mr. Shaman. I think we have no choice but to let the Bush tax cuts that favor the wealthiest 2% of Americans expire. That will get us about $800 billion over the next 10 years to invest in the kind of programs we're talking about. But the reality is this won't happen without a fight. In the last election, the election before, Democrats ran on this, and then when it came time to make the decision, they extended them for two more years. The difference is I'm willing to campaign on this, I'm willing to advocate for this all across our community, whether it's in Round Lake or Waukegan or Lake Forest or Deerfield. And I know the Republicans will come after us for this. They always do. But the reality is their memories are short. When we had those old tax rates, we created 12 million new jobs in this country under the Clinton administration. President Clinton left this country with the first surplus in generations. And yes, if you were making half a million dollars, a million, 10 million a year, you were doing just fine. They don't just have to be let expire. We have to advocate for that. We have to campaign for that. We have to make sure it happens so we make the kind of investments we all know we have to make in our communities. Thank you. Mr. Bavda. 
I support letting the Bush tax cuts expire. However, this does present a problem. We're in the middle of a recession. And classic neo-Keynesian or Keynesian economics would say you don't raise taxes on anybody during a recession. So what I think we need to do is we do need to let the Bush tax cuts expire, but we need to make them revenue neutral. In other words, we take all that money that we're saving through the Bush tax cuts and we provide it to lower income in the middle class and even to a little bit to the upper class in order to maintain that level of expenditure in the economy. We can't afford to let our economy backslide into a double dip recession. Talking about taxes more generally, I believe in a progressive tax system. I believe that corporations should be paying more of an effective tax rate. So should Warren Buffett and people like him. Like, we should have an effective minimum tax rate for, for, of 30% for gentlemen like Mr. Buffett, and I don't think he would disagree. The same thing goes with corporations. We must remember that corporations' only motive is profit. And the reality is we need to help mitigate some of the, their, mitigate some of the problems that corporations create when they move or they lose jobs, or they outsource jobs. So it's important to get all these taxes into the economy. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Tree. Yes, I absolutely am calling for the repeal and to let expire these Bush era capital gains tax cuts. Like has been said, they need to, they need to stay expired and not be renewed. But we need to be active about that because the Republicans are going to fight till the very end to keep them in place. They've all pledged their lives to Grover Norquist that they won't raise taxes and they will fight and they will fight and they will obstruct to be able to preserve this capital gain tax cut. We need to put in place a progressive tax code like was once existed in our country, but the wealthy can hire lobbyists and attorneys and special interest groups to pick away and nibble at the progressive end of the scale for the wealthy to where they carve out loopholes just for them and just for their company, which is why you have corporations paying near zero and wealthy people with a lot of tax shelters. If we eliminate those and get back to a truly progressive tax system, we will have gone a long way towards solving our nation's problems. Schneider? Same answer I had before. I keep doing this. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> um, to our next question. Um, how would you change no child left behind so that our children, all of our American children, receive a quality education? Mr. Bob. All children deserve the opportunity to attain an act. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, right. you can go. Not a problem. No, no, no. no. no go ahead. Let's, go ahead. Let's. I apologize. Mr. Shaman. Thank you. Uh, when it comes to education, look, the only reason I could sit here before you is because I got a world class public education from ESL programs at Jane Stenson Elementary in Skokie to AP classes at Stevenson High School in Lincolnshire, to being able to access a Stafford loan, go off to McGill University, get degrees in history and political science. So the foundation is a quality public education. Uh, so I think we have to do three things when it comes to education. Number one, look at the programs that work in well-funded schools, early childhood education, after school programs, small class sizes, a broad and deep curriculum, not just math and science, but also the arts, and make sure we can fund them through grants in schools that don't have access to those resources. Number two is we have to realize the greatest predictor of a child's educational success is the poverty level of their community. Kids who are hungry can't learn. Kids who are afraid of walking home from school can't learn. So we have to make sure we lift up communities broadly so kids can learn in those schools. Now the final piece when it comes to North Child Left Behind, I have to, we have to reduce our dependence on tests that don't measure growth over time. We have to have a growth model that says what have you learned from the beginning of the school year to the end. And we have to also focus on making sure we have more uh, individualized assessment rather than just a one-size-fits-all solution. Thank you. And now, Mr. Bavda. All children deserve the opportunity to attain an excellent education. When, kinder when, when children enter kindergarten, the difference between an affluent child and a child in a poverty-ridden area is a one million word deficit, meaning that, they've heard, that the affluent child has heard a million more words, whether it be reading to them or, or having their parents use an expanded vocabulary. So kids start off at, a, at an uneven playing field right now. And so what we've got to do is we've got to mandate early childhood education, and we've got to pay it for it through the estate tax because that's the, it's the perfect example of equality of, of in, up, in opportunity. If you look at the estate tax, and we can pay for that as a winning political ar argument. But talking about no child of the end more specifically, we need to have s high national standards so places like Mississippi don't automatically skate by with low standards and high proficiency test rates. We've got to make sure that we're teaching to a test worth teaching to. I propose the old Maryland model, which was only removed because it was painful for the adults and not for the children. If we do these things to reform no child left behind, we'll improve Thank education. Thank you. 
Um, Mr. Tree. Yeah, education is just critical to our future success as a global economy, where the world continues to get smaller and smaller because of IT and because of all of the progress we've made. We need to make sure that our country is competitive, and we do that through educating our students. Now, here's the facts. Right now, in the first world industrialized countries, our education system in America ranks dead last. And the hard right extremists in Congress, in their zeal to cut the government, are willing to defund education, to take money out of Pell Grant staffer loans and public schools. And that's like a farmer who eats his own seed corn. We'll be less competitive 20 years from now in the global marketplace unless we shore up our education. No Child Left Behind is a perfect example of a government program that went off the rails. And we need to get it back on track. The thing is, it became a tool to get federal dollars by teaching to a test. And the administrators would beat up the teachers. The teachers had to then teach to a test that they didn't like and they didn't feel taught the students what they needed to know. But the intent of it was good, and we need to go back and retool it to make sure that our kids are getting educated. Thank you. Mr. Schneider. This is where I think our party disagrees profoundly with the Republican Party. National education is in the national interest. China and India with 10 times as many people as us, if they educate only 10% of their kids well, they'll educate more kids well than we have kids to educate. We can't compete in a global economy if half of our kids aren't getting education at all, they're not graduating high school, they're not, those that are graduating high school, half of them are not college or career ready. President Obama and Secretary Duncan have presented a blueprint for education. I agree with Ilya, we need to make sure that we stop teaching to the test. No Child Left Behind was well-intentioned, but it created an adverse consequence of too much teaching to the test. Having navigated the school system for two boys, I have a freshman in college, they both had challenges, they both struggled, but we understood that their growth patterns were not one year or one test to one test, but 18 years long. By the time our son left to go to college, he was ready. He was college ready and is succeeding today. That's what we need for every child in the country. Thank you very much. Mr. Bobda, we will start with you this time. Um, are you in favor of continuing federal subsidies to support the construction of new nuclear power plants in light of contamination caused by the Fukushima disaster and no adequate solution to the long-term storage, for example, at least 100,000 years of nuclear waste? Uh, I don't believe that we should have new nuclear power plants. This, th I came to this decision or this uh, conclusion after much thought. I, I realize that we have a national energy problem and we need to fund renewable energy, having a renewable energy portfolio in order to provide energy for us in the long term. I think we need to make sure that we cap and trade greenhouse gases. Why? Because the greenhouse gases are an extra cost that's not being taken into account during the current, uh, with the current oil prices. So if we do that, we can price, price in that part of it and make sure that we have uh, alternative energies that can be, can, can be done profitably. Um, talking a little bit more about the environment, I think we need to support the use and development of, and the infrastructure of electric cars. The reality is in a suburb like ours, mass transit becomes very, very difficult to do. However, if we have electric cars, we eliminate greenhouse gases and we're still, and if we use renewable energy to fund our electricity, we're able to solve a, a problem of, of the environment without necessarily having mass transit. Thank you. Mr. Tree. No, I do not support spending federal dollars on subsidizing new nuclear reactors. Every single thing that we do in life has a trade-off, has an opportunity cost, in dollars and in time. The fact that you guys are all sitting here means that you're not sitting somewhere else, and I'm sure there's other places you might want to be, but that's your opportunity cost. If we take federal dollars and invest them with more nuclear reactors and more technology, that's dollars that we don't have to invest in the things that we should be investing in, in renewable energies and sustainable things that can power our next generation of people with the energy that they'll require without going down this nuclear path. I was at the Pentagon when the earthquakes happened to Japan. I'm part of the Director of Global Combat Support Team there, and we needed to move a lot of things to Japan to help them out. They're very dangerous, they're very lethal, and the fact is, it's because of those limited dollars. I would rather be investing those dollars into renewable energy technologies to bring those online in the future, as opposed to investing behind this very dangerous thing called the nuclear power. Thank you. Mr. Schneider. I think we need to be subsidizing solar energy. China is investing trillions of dollars in their solar industry and are, is soon to be leading the world. This was an industry or technology invented here. We should be making it here and we should be shipping it around the world. I think we should be investing in wind power, in geothermal, 
I agree with Vivek, we need to be investing in electric cars that we're starting to see come online, hybrids. We should be investing in technologies that will take us down a road towards energy independence and a, uh, a freedom from fossil fuels to reduce our impact on the climate. Sorry. On our impact on the climate. I'm not willing to in invest federal dollars in, in nuclear energy. There's better places we can invest those dollars. At the same time, we need to keep all of our options on the table. We sh should be investing in, in new ideas for energy. Uh, there may be a day we have nuclear f fusion. Uh, we, we've heard rumors of it my entire lifetime. When I was in high school, there was talk about it when I was in college and subsequently. But until that day comes, we need to invest in, in the sources of energy that are, are present today, solar, wind, geothermal. Thank you. Mr. Shaman. You know, we have a daily reminder of the risk of nuclear energy right here in our district, up in Zion, where we have tens of thousands of spent fuel rods sitting right on the shore of Lake Michigan, our most precious resource here in the Midwest and here in the 10th Congressional District with no long-term plan whatsoever for how do we dispose of that waste and how do we prevent a human or natural disaster from contaminating our water supply. So I've been clear from day one, not only do I not support federal dollars from new nuclear power plants, I oppose the creation of any new nuclear power plants. Look, we have nuclear in our energy supply today. I think our goal has to be reducing our reliance and over time phasing that out entirely. Because what we saw in Japan is even a very technologically sophisticated society can't deal with the consequences of a meltdown if it should happen. The risks of a meltdown are too high. The dangers of long-term storage failures are too high that I think we have to stop the construction of new nuclear power plants. I opposed the decision just a couple weeks ago to authorize two more nuclear power plants for the first time in decades. I think we have to focus on the renewable energy that everyone else up here talked about. Thank you very much. Now we'll go to our final question, and we will start with Mr. Tree. Um, what do you feel are the two biggest concerns in the 10th Congressional District? Jobs, by far, and away is the number one. And then I would say the second one is the environment. Because jobs really fuels the economic livelihood and hope that everyone will have moving forward. Right now, as I crisscross the 10th Congressional District, people are hunkered down. It's like a bunker mentality. Everyone knows someone who's been fired or someone who's been laid off, someone who showed up at work and said, you're gonna have to take a pay cut if you wanna keep your job. And so there's a hunkered down mentality, which means people aren't spending. And when people aren't spending, businesses aren't responding. It's a vicious cycle. Then businesses get that signal of lack of consumer demand, so they lay off people and the cycle continues. We need a federal jobs program. We need the federal government to step in here and shore up this decline that we're in so that we can turn things around and restore hope back to the 10th Congressional District. And then on the environment, we've already talked about it's nuclear rods right up the street. We have Lake Michigan, which is a tremendous water supply. We need to keep it fresh. We need to keep it clean and viable for the future. Thank you. Mr. Schneider. To me, there's two sides of the same coin, sustainable prosperity and sustainable security. We can't have one without the other. We need to ha have our economy growing and creating jobs. We can't have a sustainable economy if we don't invest in education, in invest in education and ha have every child, like I said before, graduate career ready, college ready. But at the same time, we need security, and security is both security at home, security worldwide. We need robust safety nets that people don't th fall through the cracks. And at the same time, we're working to fill those cr cracks along the way. We need a solid and sound in energy policy. We need a solid and sound environmental policy. We need a solid and sound foreign policy. All of those have to work together. We need a government that can handle more than one problem at one time. Big solutions to challenge our, our large and looming problems. So we pass, as I, I said in my opening, to the next generation a, a sustainable security and prosperity. Mr. Shaman. Everywhere I go in the district, I hear the same story, that the economic security that people were promised, that the previous generation had passed on, is slipping further and further out of reach. That takes different forms in different parts of the district. In Waukegan, it could be the inability to pay your mortgage month to month, the inability to get a job for five or 10 years at a time. In Buffalo Grove, it could take the form of always being one step away from losing your health insurance. Or here, it could be the fact that your son or daughter comes home from college, has $100,000 in student debt, and doesn't have the first job on the horizon. Somewhere else, it could take the form of just the insecurity of knowing how you'll pay your next month's rent. The solution to all these problems is the s one and the same. Pass federal jobs legislation. I was with Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky in Rogers Park when she introduced a plan that would create 2.2 million good paying jobs in this country right now. Support federal investment in infrastructure so people have money in their pockets that they could spend at local businesses. 
provide support for small business owners to make those one or two hires in the form of a green energy jobs bank. And finally, providing support for state and local governments. So we're not laying off cops, teachers, sanitation workers when their services are most needed. If we do that, we'll provide some semblance of economic security again. Thank you. Mr. Bogda. The number one issue is jobs. I know how hard this job market is. After I graduated in, from law school in 2009, I couldn't find a job. I had to work at Macy's to make ends meet. I know how bad it is. I have three degrees, one from Northwestern. You wouldn't think that would happen to me, but it did. But more importantly is what is creating jobs for everyone in our district. The reality is that any of the national jobs plans that my opponents talk about will not pass because we don't have 60 votes in the United States Senate to break a filibuster. That's why I proposed a Chicagoland jobs plan where we double the number of lanes on 90 and 94, invest in a smart grid and provide aid to state and local governments. Why will my plan pass as opposed to everyone else's? Well, first of all, even Republicans agreed on roads. Even Republicans will agree to cut a tax hike or a utility tax rate increase to fund that project. And finally, I would condition aid to state and local governments on a new policy where the state government would be required to keep a certain percentage of their tax revenue with the federal government, a rainy day fund, if you will. And that money would be re-released during recessions. This is how we create jobs. Thank you very much. Now we'll go to the candidate's closing statements. Each candidate will have one minute to um, sum their uh, statement up. And we will begin with Mr. Schneider. Thank you. And again, I want to thank you all for having this forum. Um, I graduated college in 1983. There were no jobs. It was the worst recession since then, the Great Depression. I left for a year. I worked on a kibbutz as an engineer. I came back. The economy had turned around. I understand what kids today are going through coming out of school, but it's not a one-year turnaround. We're the fourth year in this uh, bumpy, slow recovery. But we're making progress. We're moving, sl we're moving slowly, but we're moving forward. We need to make sure that we continue to move forward. I've put together a campaign over the last nine months that's focused on my experience, on my values, my ideas for help moving this, this country forward. It's a campaign that's drawn a lot of attention. I've gotten the endorsements from local people, from Susan Garrett, from Jeff Schoenberg State Senators, from Marty Moylan. We've got endorsements from Labor. We've gotten the support from the very beginning, one of my mentors, Melissa Bean. We've gotten national support. I've been endorsed by the New Democrat Coalition, by, by uh, Senate, uh, Minority Whip Steny, or House Minority Whip Steny Hoyer. And I've been endorsed by both newspapers. We have a chance to change the direction of this country with a positive message of moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Shaman. We find ourselves in a brand new 10th Congressional District, a district that we've lost by two or three percentage points in four of the last six elections that has now become the most Democratic seat in the whole country held by a Republican, one that Dan Seals would have won with 52% of the vote in the last election. So the chance we have here today is not just to turn a red district blue, but to send a bold progressive advocate to Congress to fight for you. Because while we may all say similar things on all the issues, the reality is we all know that when it comes to legislation, it's not just about the yes or no vote at the end. It's about whether you'll have an advocate there on your side the whole time. When I was at moveon.org, I fought for real health care reform with a public option. People like Melissa Bean in Congress worked to take that out, to let the private sector actually benefit more. The choice you face in this election is this. Would you prefer a member of Congress more like Melissa Bean or more like Jan Schakowsky? I will be a member of Congress in the Jan Schakowsky mold. I've been endorsed by the co-chairs of the Progressive Caucus, Keith Ellison, Raul Gralva, allies like Governor Howard Dean, the former chair of the Democratic Party, and the DCCC's co-chair of its Red to Blue Committee, Don Edwards. I will always stand up and fight for you. Thank you. Mr. Bavda. I will be an advocate for you. I think you should vote, though, for the person that's most qualified. First of all, I have I've, I've economic, macroeconomic theory experience. I've worked for the Federal Reserve. I understand what middle class loan applicants go through when they have to put a loan, and I've prevented, this, I've prevented discrimination against middle class loan applicants. I've seen how Wall Street works, or at least under how the financial world works. Um, and that gives me a very good perspective on what it takes to manage our economy, a $15 trillion economy, I might add. I've also, I've also done Teach for America for two years out in Compton, California. I know what our education policy needs to be. It's th those are the number one and two issues affecting our district. Look, I've also been a public finance consultant. I understand budget and tax policy. I understand what f how fiscal impact models are created. I've also got a master's degree in public management and policy and analysis with an education policy focus. I've prevented a ban on stem cell research. I've, I'm a proven fighter. I know what it takes to battle right-wing extremism that would have us have the government. In, and I'm also an attorney as well. I think I'm Thank the most you. qualified, to, so please vote for me. Thank you very much. Mr. Tree. 
Vivek said you should vote for the most qualified person. I thought he was about to endorse me. <laughs> the, the fact is, I'm a 22-year veteran of the Air Force. I'm a colonel at the Pentagon. If I get elected to Congress, I'll get onto the House Armed Services Committee. I'm calling for a reduction in defense spending to be able to take that money and pay down the debt, as well as invest in America, invest in education, invest in jobs. I believe this is a fight worth fighting. I lived a very happy life over in Long Grove as a military man, as a businessman, having two careers in one, managing both up till age 45. Life is complicated, life is hard, and life is messy. I lost my 19-year-old daughter last August to a drug overdose. She's dead, and I'll never get her back. But I'll tell you what, I believe that life is worth living, and I believe that our journey is worth fighting. I just had a newborn baby four weeks ago, so life is continuing for us here in the Tree family. And I believe that this is a fight that we need to win. There's no prize in winning the nomination on March 20th if we're just going to lose to Bob Dole in the fall. So you need to keep in mind who can beat Bob Dole. I can carry the base. I can win in the middle. This is not Jan Schakowsky's district. We need someone who can win this district to go to the Congress and make a difference. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Union League Club and the League of Women Voters, um, let's give a hand to your four terrific candidates. Thank you very much, gentlemen.